Well, hi, everyone. Um, welcome to this session. My name is Ajay. Um, I'm delighted to be here with you. We're going to share some perspectives with you about bias, a systems view of bias that helps you as developers, as designers, as product leaders, think about it when you build AI systems and a technique for detecting bias in data sets. This is a talk by me and my colleague, Ramya Srinivasan. We'll start out by talking about bias uh, in a big picture sense, and then we will, in the second half of the talk, speak about a data set technique. Let me introduce where we work and come from, because that informs our perspective about these questions. We both work at Fujitsu Labs. Fujitsu is Japan's number one IT services provider. It's the fifth largest IT services provider in the world. We work in the California labs based in Silicon Valley. And our lab is primarily a human in the loop systems lab. So we work on problems at the intersection of computing science and cognitive science. Fujitsu also has many customers that are enterprises. And working with enterprises in many verticals gives us a rich set of research problems to work on. And the perspective that we take in our AI research team is to look at the evolution of businesses over the next decade or so. So it's our firm belief that across the world, businesses are reorganizing themselves from how they are structured today, which is intelligence is a part. So the intelligences in this room are apart from the intelligences in your pockets and on your laps. The machine intelligence and the human intelligence is not computationally linked together in the way that it is going to get start, started to link together. So there will come a time, a few decades from now, where we will have autonomous intelligences on the planet that we will recognize as first order in the same way we recognize our intelligence as a first order intelligence. But in the next one to two decades, we're going to live through an era of increasingly augmented intelligence and businesses augmenting the sensing capabilities of us with IoT, the decision making capabilities of us with AI, and the acting capabilities of us with software and hardware robots. So when you think about this as the mega change happening over the next couple of decades, it informs what kind of research questions you look at, and specifically it will inform how we look at bias and um, in the design of AI systems that provide true augmentation to our intelligence. Within this view, what we really want are AI systems that we can manage. We don't want black box AI systems that are very good at doing something, but the interfaces to them are very brittle because they cannot be edited, they cannot be engaged with the people outside of the, the folks who created them. So our customers, and I think global customers, are expecting AI, expecting the new promise of AI to be realized by AI systems that enable true uh, partnership with people across, um, uh, across the technical ability spectrum. So to, to give, uh, look at an example of how AI systems are built today, let's take a abstracted view of building a supervised machine learning model. So let's say you work for um, some company which has a customer service portal, and somebody on the business or product management side comes and asks you and wants to build some recommendation system that perhaps finds a relevant prior question to a new question that a customer asks. So you might um, start out, uh, so this question might be given to somebody in the um, data science team that may have some graduate level coursework on NLP in this case or some relevant machine learning model. This person would start out by thinking of this problem as a data problem and collecting data that they think is relevant to building the right kind of learning model. They would split the data into training and test data. They would construct an AI pipeline based on their knowledge of research and industry practice, then train and test this pipeline using the data sets that they have, and essentially see if the performance of this pipeline is acceptable on the metrics that they have been given from the product side. And this overall interaction between the people building these AI systems and uh, it can essentially be summarized as data to AI pipeline, train, on, train the AI pipeline on the data, test uh, as long as the performance is good enough, deploy it. So bias creeps in in every step of this process. Bias is not sort of the responsibility or the 
the responsibility to manage or introduce only for one person in this pipeline, but it's essentially a systems problem. So if you think about the interface between business or product and data science, what's the word I'm looking for? Articulating or perhaps abstracting a given business problem as a data science problem, that alone can bring in uh, the, a perspective bias and shift the problem itself from what was the original intention. Certainly, we all understand as, understand as practitioners today that there's a lot of bias in data, um, and that is certainly a key source of introducing bias into the predictions of AI systems. There's also, we're all human beings. We know that machine learning is accelerating at a rapid pace. There's about 100 papers in some form of AI or machine learning research being published every week. So we certainly do not know uh, much of what is out there in terms of the best techniques to solve certain problems. So our own human bias creeps in in terms of the limitation of our knowledge. And then finally, we're all working at enterprises which want to build products to serve people. And there is a certain timeliness scarcity in order to build for building those things. And that brings in this just make it work kind of bias. And I think uh, it's me, I see a lot of smiling faces around the room around this kind of bias. So I think you all sort of uh, uh, have perhaps felt or lived it. So uh, when we started out on our research project of addressing these kinds of limitations of current AI systems, we thought it would probably best to articulate the current state of AI practice, essentially dark AI. Not just are the models itself in mostly black box, but the process for getting at those models is also like, uh, uh, is not, not well lit, is not well guided. And this kind of AI is not quite suited for the kind of uh, empowerment of everybody with AI, that is the vision of modern AI, and that is certainly the possibility of modern AI. So when we look at how we could actually improve things, it's instructed to look at who might we want to empower with a different kind of set of AI technologies. So we most, we're most comfortable, uh, perhaps, in this room with the left side of this axis, the left side of this human-in-the-loop axis. But we're really mostly serving at least businesses and consumers, and increasingly there's regulatory attention on the products that we build. And what do we do when we build or use AI services? So let's call that the co-creation axis. Um, maybe we are selecting or building some AI at the bottom of that axis. We build the AI, we ask it a question, we are hearing its answer, and then we are growing and deploying that AI. So the set of technologies that make it possible, not just for AI scientists and AI engineers to build and select AI, but everybody, all the way from, from 10-year-olds to, uh, to executives who don't have technical background but have a lot of business intelligence to select and build AI systems, that set of technologies in the community is, is starting to be recognized as accessible AI. Perhaps the most attention as a term has been put on Ex explainable AI, which is a set of technologies that allows AI systems to complement its predictions and decisions with an explanation as to why it came to that particular decision. And then finally, and most interesting, interestingly in terms of increasing the agency of everybody to interact with AI systems, an emerging set of technologies that allows you to edit the AI directly is uh, termed under the umbrella of interactive AI. So our research team broadly works on these three aspects of transparency for different kinds of humans in the loop. So at any point in this two-dimensional grid, maybe what does a software engineer need to do to be able to uh, select AIs more accessibly? What does a consumer need to do to want get answers, explanations from AI more easily? Each, at each spot, there is a wonderful research program instead of applied research questions that are exciting and relevant to um, to business processes and software. Now, with this big picture view, let's now talk about bias. Uh, bias for us, it's useful to look at bias in the context of artificial intelligence itself as an evolution of how we write software. So when I was going to school, the classic, one of the classic books for understanding how we write programs was this book called Algorithms Plus Data Structure Equals Programs. And this was about, let's say, you know, um, let's say some of the more systematic ways to think about writing programs, the introduction of the first uh, higher order programming languages was really happening in the 60s. So 20 years after that, there was a book that was uh, telling students who, was, who were learning computing, 
you have to think about what are the steps for your program. That's the algorithm. And you have to think about how you are going to encode your data. Uh, and that's the data structure. And then you would take this program, and the input would give you the output. Today, we're in a different world. That equation doesn't apply, as you well know, because we are no longer specifying the sequence of steps in an algorithm for somebody, for, for a program to give us an answer. We are now building programs that learn. So in order to do that, we're building learning algorithms. So gradient descent, for example, is a learning algorithm. We're building learning structures, a neural network, or a probabilistic graphical model, or a Q network. Those are all learning structures. And then we're putting into all this data to get a learned model. So the equivalent, as you all know, of a program in software 2.0 world is the learned model. And the learned model usage is then you give this learned model an input and gives you an output. So we never used to talk about bias here because we knew exactly what the program was going to do because no matter how complex the algorithm, it was deterministic. We could see it, we could write it down, and we could ask, of, ask and think about its properties through a variety of techniques, all the way from mathematical logic and formal verification to dynamic testing at runtime. The same thing is now starting to happen with AI systems. So there is an entire set of research techniques that are just starting to bloom to bring into the modern world the, uh, the issue of quality control over AI systems. So bias is one aspect of quality control of AI and machine learning systems. In order to think about whether your system is biased or not or has some other property that you want or not, you have to think hard about what kind of system you want. This is not something that um, an algorithm will tell you. Uh, you are the one, you, your business, are the one who are building these kinds of systems. So you have to think hard about what kind of system you want. One thing that algorithms can do is they can assist you in coming up with specs depending on their recognition of how the data is being used in the context of actual uh, system features. So it's our belief that AI testing, just like software testing, differentiates robust and resilient software systems from those that are not so, AI testing will also differentiate robust and resilient AI systems from the rest. And bias testing will become an essential part of this AI testing, specifically because the equation that we're working with here is learning algorithms plus learn, learning structures plus data is the learned model. So the bias part comes into testing uh, in all three of those things. So one of the takeaways from this slide is you have to think about what kind of system you want. Um, where can we look for guidance there? Well, one place where we can look for guidance is what do laws, policies, and regulations say? Because these are not just guidance, these are requirements for us. I think most, if not all of you, build systems that are globally deployed or uh, would be globally deployed. And so an awareness about where law, policy, regulation already is in the major international markets or is going is essential to think about the question of what are these specifications you would like to uh, meet, have your AI system meet. So let me talk about three categories of these emerging regulations. One comes from, uh, I live and work in the United States, so I can speak uh, perhaps with a little bit more confidence regarding the emerging regulatory trends there. And I will give you an outline there. I think it's applicable um, globally just because our software is global. We'll talk about some specifications of bias and some approaches that are emerging in designing ethical products. So. Within the first topic, emerging regulatory trends, um, there's a few different places where that emergence is happening. Certainly, there's federal legislation, legislation at the level of the federal government in, in which, whichever geography you're looking at. There's also state and local le legislation. Some states are really populous, or, um, and therefore, whatever they say is the law of the land in their state actually impacts the central law. Uh, this can also be applied. The EU, the European Union, recently had a big regulation around global data use. And that actually has impacted businesses across the world because the way that the regulation is written, it applies to citizens of the EU no matter where they are in the world. So that's the second part. Uh, that's, that's the third part, international law and so on. So federal legislation. Um, the takeaway, at least in the United States, is that over the last several decades, there have been broad expansion of anti-discrimination laws, whether it's around sex, 
religion, race, and other kinds of, the number of protected categories are increasing. This is not just true in the United States, this is also true in Asia, it's also true in, um, in the EU. In India itself, the Supreme Court has made some landmark legislations over the last one year itself, and if you look at the last two, three decades, it's the same vector happening in all geographies. So awareness of these things is important when you build AI systems. Um, state and local legislation. So for example, the current government of the United States uh, rolled back some automotive emission requirements for automotive ma makers. But California, just a few months ago, said, no, we would like to keep to a certain set of emissions. And all automakers decided that that's what they will agree to at the, uh, at the, at the national level. So states have very broad powers. San Francisco um, recently made some local legislations about banning the use of facial recognition for certain kind of police activity. And that actually will um, constrain how such technology can be used beyond just San Francisco itself. International law also is an interesting place and a very relevant place to look at where these specifications for uh, not introducing bias in your systems come from because international treaties together with many national constitutions essentially imply that they're the equivalent of local laws in those geographies. I'll just mention that there's a lot of active research happening in the ac academic community, both around fairness, algorithmic fairness, accountability, and transparency. So if you want to uh, look for what's happening, you can look for this acronym FAT, uh, which stands for Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency, as well as in the humanities in an area called critical data studies, which looks at social power structures and, um, and how technologies are, are enforcing those. So let's get a little bit more technical um, and talk about specifying bias, not from the places that they are uh, coming from regulation, but also from um, how you would start looking at them, them in terms of categories of um, uh, anti-bias properties. So we can think of these in, in at least these four ways. Prediction bias speaks to your AI system is systematically mispredicting with respect to an existing protected category. So in hiring decisions, for example, if you are mispredicting a certain gender for a certain role, that could come from many different reasons. It could be a bias in your data set, but the point is that the specification you're looking for needs to not mispredict with respect to a certain uh, protection. Prejudgment is a um, is a legal term which represents the situation where the person responsible for judging something has already made a decision about what they're going to do even before going through the process. And it doesn't matter if the result that they come through at the end of the process is the same as the one they decided on early on. Prejudgment is, um, is a very clear thing that you have to make sure your automated systems uh, don't have. Perception is reality, quite honestly, and one of the biggest places where we're seeing debates in the media and in technology is about the perception of bias in machine learning systems, whether or not, not that bias exists. And you can expect, I personally expect to see a lot of activity in the political sphere, in the marketing sphere, in the technological sphere, in the United States, certainly uh, around the last election, bias around the role of social media in influencing people is a hot topic of conversation. Uh, and I expect the same thing to happen as tools get used for making judicial decisions, policing decisions in, um, in India, in the United States, in, in Europe, and uh, in China, and so on. Um, the last piece from a policy perspective to be aware of as you think about designing ethical products is um, what are the ways in which people engage with the judicial systems to defend their rights? So um, two bodies of legal work are around procedural rights and substantive rights. So procedural rights are about the processes that you follow for making sure that your rights are fairly enforced. So if you feel that an automated system violated one of your rights, there is actually judicial process in most geographies across the world that is available to people to seek redressal. In fact, the European Union's GDPR specifically encodes in the GDPR what you can do if a algorithmic data-driven system has made a certain decision about you. So this is becoming, all of what I was saying right now, it sounds like what we are talking about is just what's been happening in the legal sphere, but there's emerging uh, data regulations in different geographies, the largest of which is the uh, GDPR in EU, that actually encodes in its regulation uh, 
privileges and rights for people, the origins of which come from, from case law and, and, um, and judicial practice. The second set of things you have to think about when you build AI systems is, are you doing something to the population at large that is diminishing their material rights? For example, things, rights to food, clothing, shelter, social services, et cetera. Um, now, even a system that builds customer service portals at an airline, for example, if there is some substantive right that is being diminished for a certain class of people, perhaps because of the way they phrase a certain query, because of perhaps the, um, uh, perhaps the way colloquialisms exist in a certain area, that would run into a substantive, substantive rights problem. In the research community, as you can tell, uh, this has become a rapidly, uh, rapidly important piece of research. And my takeaway for you guys from all of this is perception is reality. So when you're building software systems, when you're building software systems that use artificial intelligent techniques, think about bias just in this simple way. Your system is essentially distributing opportunity. The person who is giving out the opportunity, let's say I am giving out jobs, or if I'm, the, if I'm a judge deciding the sentence for somebody, or if, I'm, um, uh, if I am building an airline system that decides whether or not to give you a free upgrade from one class of seating to another class of seating. Am I blocking your opportunity? That's really what bias is about. And at the same time, for the person who is distributing these things, bias is about risk management and maximizing overall return. And that's really what your systems have to look at. So how does transparency fit in? How does building, generally speaking, technologies that allow transparency address bias that, is, that, has, a lot of, um, that has a lot of legal constraints around it? So from our point of view, it's essential to have these interaction points to reveal and react to bias. So we spoke, spoke earlier about transparency. Let's see how, if we were to have transparent AI systems, how a business person could interact with an AI system. So the first interaction point would not be to, uh, would not be to abstract a given business problem into a data problem, but it would simply be to ask a trained AI model a question. So accessible AI technologies enable that. The, Explainable AI technologies allow you as a person to get an answer with an explanation as opposed to a data set or a vector with various probabilities that is hard for you to parse. A person, an, a data scientist can map mathematical results from prediction algorithms with their expectation of what the results should be. But a person has beliefs and they are going to map what answer they got against those beliefs. And interactive AI allows you to update the AI itself or update your own beliefs. And so this new loop looks like asking the AI, getting an answer with an explanation, testing against your belief, and updating either your beliefs or the AI. The first step where you are able to ask questions of an AI and because you don't have to be an AI scientist to be able to ask those questions or encode those questions in mathematical structures whereby you can get an answer, means that you are going to end up with a lot more diverse and inclusive set of questions. In the very first place of bias, I said bias, uh, perception is reality. So you can ask the kinds of questions that matter to you. And by doing so, you are forcing in your process of building an AI system at least an awareness of how your AI system will be used. When answers from AI systems come with explanations, it becomes much easier for even us that we're building those systems to recognize that there is some bias uh, unintentionally in most cases, and that bias gets revealed. And in interactivity, we can react to those bias. So the general body of research that is going on around these three pillars of transparency very directly addresses um, these bias issues. So that was the broad systems view. Um, we're now going to talk about a technique for recognizing bias in data sets. And for that, uh, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Ramya. Uh, so this technique is called as topological data analysis, and uh, it stems from a branch of mathematics called as topology, which is the study of shapes. 
So, uh, interestingly we know that data also has shape right. If you consider a simple logistic regression uh, uh, model, it is basically trying to fit a straight line to a set of data points and in higher dimensions it is uh, understanding the separating hyperplanes. So, topological data analysis also studies the shape in data and in terms of not uh, straight lines or uh, hyperplanes, but in terms of topological features such as clusters, holes, voids across different spatial resolutions. What those topological features mean we will see a little later, but uh, we can think of topological data analysis as an independent and complementary tool to existing machine learning algorithms to analyze data. And the benefit of this is this is applicable to sparse data sets and can also be used in conjunction with machine learning algorithms for a variety of purposes. So, TDA or topological data analysis offers two fundamental advantages. First, it can be used as an effective feature extraction algorithm. So, you can uh, take any type of input data, categorical image or um, any other type and uh, extract topological features from them and then feed it to supervised, unsupervised or even reinforcement learning algorithms. And second advantage TDA offers is in terms of uh, data visualizations. You have different types of visualizations, we will be seeing a couple of them. Uh, the one you see on the left is called as a mapper function, uh, the, sorry the right one is a mapper function, the left one is barcodes. So, these are uh, useful for analyzing different types of data as you will see. So, in the rest of this talk uh, we will understand first what are these topological features, how, they, how can they be identified in data sets. Uh, basically the idea is to identify invariant topological features. So, those are the characteristic features of your data. So, how can we do that and then how can we visualize them and coming back to the topic of this talk, uh, how can this be used to identify a bias in data sets and we will see some method, uh, the results on a real world data set. So, first question, so what are topological features? I mentioned these are like clusters and holes in data sets. So, you have set of points and a cluster or a connected component is basically like a bunch in your data set as simple as the one you see here on your left. These are like components which are connected within your data set. So, this is called as a zero dimensional topological feature. A one dimensional topological feature is a hole uh, which is like characterized by a uh, cavity in the center. At high in higher dimensions you have voids like you can imagine that to be a sphere with a cavity or a hole in the center and so on in higher dimensions. So, in order to identify these topological features we see that these data points which are your individual data samples in your training data set have to be connected in some format. So, that is how we can identify topological features right. So, in order to identify these kinds of topological features we need to get some kind of structures in data like in kind in traditional machine learning we try to get in terms of uh, so in neural networks you identify certain kinds of uh, patterns in your data. So, in a similar vein here we identify that in terms of simplices. A simplice is just nothing but a generalization of a triangle in higher dimensions. So, a point is a zero dimensional simplex, a line is a one dimensional simplex and so on and a combination of simplices uh, will give a simplicial complex. So, these are the fundamental uh, units to identify topological features in your data set because if you have a two dimensional simplex you can easily visualize a hole in that, a three dimensional simplex will give a void and so on. Now, in order to uh, connect the data points to identify these simplicial uh, complexes there are different methods and the choice of a method is uh, based on what type of data you have. For example, for image data you use Morse complexes, uh, for categorical data typically RIPS complex is used uh, and that is what we will be using uh, for the rest of this uh, talk. So, a RIPS complex is nothing but uh, if you have a set of data points like the one you can see on your right, you have a bunch of uh, data points, the red dots which are zero dimensional simplices. Uh, in order to connect them, uh, we just say that if two points are within a certain threshold, we just connect them. So, you get some one dimensional simplices uh, like the black lines you see there because two points are connected when their distance is less than a certain threshold and you repeat this process for all the points. So, if three points are close enough you also get a two dimensional simplices like a triangle which is the light blue region here and similarly a tetrahedron for a three dimensional simplex. So, you get a simplicial complex like this. So, coming back to the question of how do we identify invariant topological features, 
So, the idea is to uh, construct these simplices across different spatial resolutions. And the spatial resolutions are varied by varying the, uh, the distance here. So, here we can set a threshold uh, like R and say within a certain distance r we connect all the points. But this distance r can be varied so that we can get different kinds of structures. Uh, so that is what this does, a method called as persistence homology. So here if you look at this figure there are several points uh, shown by the red dots individually and they are all disjoint initially uh, for a radius of say 0.3. Now as I increase the radius uh, to 0.7 some of these points get connected. And so you begin to see certain kinds of topological features. So for example, there is a hole uh, in the second figure and the central one on the top. And as you increase the radius further, you can see very clearly a central hole and the small hole that was there initially is now shrinking. As the radius is further increased, the central hole is shrinking further and at its, and some point the hole disappears. So you see that there are certain topological features which appear and disappear. But there are certain topological features that persist across different uh, values of your radius. So the ones which persist across different values of your radius are more likely characteristics of your data. And that is the idea we will use to understand uh, bias in data set also. So how do we visualize this? Um, so as I said there are different methods and here we are using what is called as persistence barcode. So for example, if your data set was somewhat like a circle and so the one on your left is some set of points which represents a circle. Now when the radius is uh, a small value, all these points are disjoint. But as you increase the radius, some of these points co get connected and then you can see that there will be a central hole. So the barcodes actually represent the same thing. It uh, represents the duration for which a topological feature exists. So uh, the red lines that you see on the rightmost figure are the individual points like the zero dimensional simplices. But as you increase the radius to some value, you can see the central hole which persists for a long time that can be seen as the blue bar on the top. So a distinguishing feature of your, or your characteristic feature of your data is one that persists for a long time. So those are uh, the topological features of interest for us. So let's connect it back to identifying bias in data sets. So this is like a pre-processing step. Bias can be identified at different uh, points like pre-processing, in-processing and post-processing meaning before you apply any classification algorithm, during the time you apply and after you apply. So this is before you apply. So it's a data pre-processing step. So remember we just saw that persistence uh, barcodes uh, capture the uh, invariant features in your data set. So for example, if these two are some toy data sets and they represent some features in your data set say like age or gender which are protected attributes. If a particular attribute had um, bias in your data set, for example in a loan application scenario, if all the young people were denied a loan or all the females were denied a loan for some reason. so. If you plot the points, basically the x coordinate of this point is the protected attribute like the age or gender and the y coordinate is the decision in this case let us say loan default. So if a particular group was biased, uh, we can see that there will be a cluster or um, a kind of uh, group within the data set for them. So uh, and therefore that cluster can be easily visualized in terms of uh, barcode. Uh, which is long in length. And you can also validate this in terms of uh, statistical tests because the topological features are not well characterized. We have to use non-statistical non permutation tests and uh, I won't go into the details of this but basically uh, let me just jump to the case study. This was on German credit scoring data set where the goal was to predict loan default prediction and there were 1000 instances. The protected attributes were age and gender. Uh, and so these are the results. Uh, we can easily see that um, barcodes of age are longer than that of gender. And whenever there is a long barcode which persists for a long time, it is more likely to indicate that there is bias due to that particular attribute in your data set. And if you look at gender or job, those are more or less uniform, so there is no bias due to data set. Uh, and we can also validate it with uh, AI Fairness 360 which is an open source tool from IBM and that also validates our results saying that out of 
five metrics, uh, four show bias due to age, but none of them should say there is bias due to gender. So, so with that, uh, I think I'm running out of time. So I will. Uh, so these are just some FAQs uh, for. Uh, better. Uh, so I think at this point. Um, I, I'll be happy, we'll be happy to take questions. So if you want to connect with us for or engage or work with us, uh, please feel free to write to us here. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, thank you for the talk. And I think the this topic is very much you know exciting and needed at this moment. Uh, because sooner or later we need to start using with the general uh, use cases and all where it matters a lot. So uh, yes, on the uh, on the explainable and all part, it is good. Do we have some sort of a library as well, which is uh, like added to like Python and all, which we can import and directly use those functions, or do we need to write on our own? You mean for explainable AI in general? Yes. Uh, there are several um, uh, open source tools. I wouldn't say libraries, but there is just a lot of work. I don't know if you have heard about Lime, which is very popular and used across. Uh, but there are several, it depends on what kind of data sets you have. So there are several open source codes uh, and probably even libraries as such. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the talk. Uh, my name is Ranga. So I just wanted your thoughts, Dr. Chandra, and maybe you on. Um, in the community, there is a talk about the trade-off between explainable AI and performance, right? So as an example, uh, I read a use case where you know a company wanted to roll out an offer to so many users on their platform, and let's say out of one million, you want to select you know a thousand people, and you can build a model in very fast time. It gives you the answers, but then the next question you ask is why were these people picked? And if those, were they interacting in the platform? Did their network grow? And depending on what they did on the platform, let's say you wanted to uh, customize the message so that they are more likely to take that offer, then those things are not possible with, a, uh, with an algorithm or a model that, that peaks on performance. But then you need explainable AI. But to do explainable AI, then you have to come to component models or something else like that. So what is your general experience and take on this trade-off that at least is spoken about in the community. Sure, I can, I can offer my perspective. So, um, so you may have heard that there is a program sponsored by DARPA in the US. It started about two years ago. It's, XA, it's called the XAI program. There's 11 universities and institutions in the United States that are funded by it. The founding question for that program uh, two years ago was exactly what you raised. Uh, does there need to be a trade-off between explainability and performance? And over the last two years, every six months or a year, they make public presentations about the progress in those 11 institutions. These include places like um, MIT, Berkeley, Stanford, others. Um, and so researchers are actually making rapid progress in that trade-off not being necessarily as stark as it was, uh, I would say, three years ago uh, itself. So that's, that's one thing. There is very promising news in terms of technical innovations. Uh, the other thing is also, if you think about, the way we think about explainability is that explainability is risk management. You know, when you hire a new person in your team, you give them interviews. You maybe ask somebody as a reference for, how does this person work? How does she respond in these situations? What are you doing there? You're essentially trying to understand that person, even though you've not had a chance to have that person be deployed in a certain scenario for your work. So uh, in life, explainability is often a risk management tool. And with these AI black boxes, we don't necessarily need only those black boxes to be explainable to be able to do proper risk management around them. We can do increasing testing of those black boxes. And so there's a field of AI testing. The first IEEE conference on AI testing just started uh, I, April of this year, I believe. And so there is more methods that do risk management rather than just explanation in order to increase our confidence to deploy these systems that have high accuracy, but perhaps now have greater test coverage through new, new, uh, new mechanisms. So those are some of the thoughts on that question. Hey, uh, thank you for the talk. It was really interesting. 
can you uh, uh, talk a little bit about the cases, like a use case, where uh, the topological features have been extracted and have been directly integrated in the machine learning algorithms? Uh, it would be nice if, if you can take an example from a banking or a finance domain. Uh, from finance domain? Banking or finance. Yeah, so the one which we discussed here was uh, for loan default, right? Um, so as far as I'm aware, most of the topological data analysis has been used in uh, computer vision, like for pose estimation, structure recognition, uh, in natural language processing, and mostly in time series analysis for detecting anom anomalies and so on. We aren't aware of any work there where they have used this for banking or for detection of bias. So yeah. Uh, Hi, uh, this is Abhishek here. Uh, uh, thank you so much for the talk. I have a very naive question actually. You, in the case study you showed, you talked about gender and uh, think uh, age as uh, to find if there was a bias or not. I'm assuming they were not part of the model which actually gave the decision. Uh, this was an independent analysis to see if they are still having a bias. Yeah. If, if that was the case, how about we just use a simple method like a correlation or a chi-square test to see if it is working? Why should we go ahead and make sure we do uh, our code analysis that you presented? Yeah, so you cannot, um, I mean, if you just do like skewness of data or correlation of data, it's not necessary that it will identify all the uh, features. The advantage of using a technique such as TDA uh, is that it can identify it at different spatial resolution which is not the case with like uh, metric like skewness or correlation. And uh, secondly, the one that I compared it with the, the IBM AI fairness tool here, they are also not using simple techniques like correlation or skewness. These are like uh, statistical parity, difference parity, uh, equal opportunity difference and so on. So in the fairness community or in the bias and fairness fact community that Ajay mentioned, these are some ex, uh, known accepted, uh, what would I say, metrics to analyze bias. So correlation is not definitely going to capture uh, the ones that you need from the data, yeah. Thank you for your talk. Um, so, yeah. 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 So you mentioned uh, your technique as, uh, you know, applying after the model has been trained and has predicted. No, before. Before? Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, how can you deal with data that is inherently biased? So even in the data collection process, there might be biases, right? This is going to identify a bias. This is not going to eliminate bias. This no, is no, of for course, data. but how would you, uh, you know, one thing I didn't understand is that, uh, so if this, uh, in this case at least, what you're saying is that uh, the, the places, uh, for example, let's take a, uh, variable like age, uh, sorry, like gender, which is sensitive, right? And we don't want to discriminate based on this particular variable. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that in the data collection process itself, if there are biases which creep in, then can this deal with that as well? So this uh, is a identify. method to identify yeah, bias identify. in data. Deal so, as in identify that, that's my So problem. data collection is not in the control of an algorithm, right? It's mostly in the control of people or whatever. So, uh, hey, uh, this is Teja. Thanks for a wonderful talk. So, my question is mostly about uh, uh, the removal of bias. So, for example, uh, you've mentioned that uh, this bias identification can come in any uh, can come in at any instance of the pipeline, like uh, when you're building a model or you know, preparing data. Uh, what if it can come at a cost of a dip in performance of the model and this dip in performance of the model can hold f for at least considerable amount of time, uh, would the businesses have an incentive to uh, invest in bias removal just because they're getting a high return on investment uh, because of the lack of removal of bias? Uh, what happens in that scenario? Would they work, would they be uh, dictated by the rules and the fear of law or would they do something else in order to ensure that the performance does not dip just because the bias is removed from the data and the models are not, uh, you know, uh, that's, that's the issue. So my, uh, my, both my opinion as well as what I'm seeing in the market is 
um, is along two dimensions in the context of your question. One is definitely regulation. So if there was not GDPR, which became law in 2018, uh, certainly businesses would treat bias as they have treated security for decades. I think it's only in this last decade when we've had hacks on the orders of crores of people, millions of people, tons of people, that, that businesses recognize that they have to invest in security. Um, because of GDPR, many data-driven businesses are, are have a way to quantify the cost of a decision that they cannot defend. Uh, the GDPR specifically puts in about 4% of annual revenues as the the fines that would be imposed. And in fact, there are already cases of the maximum fine being imposed on some international organizations. So certainly that is acting as a clear business imperative for businesses to look at in their entire process and not just in their data when bias might creep in. And it actually starts from, just to touch on one of the earlier questions, by asking a whole set of diverse questions uh, at the product management level, at the uh, business, uh, sorry, service design level, that while discussing those questions, you come up with data collection processes, data sanitization processes that reduce the chances of bias. I think the second, the second aspect of uh, the business imperative is profit-driven, more diverse and inclusive businesses that are doing a good job providing services. If I can, give, if I can provide loans across various uh, attributes of people, and those loans are going to be well-performing because my AI systems are not uh, sensitive to or, or not overfitting with respect to certain things, that's good business for me. So I think the second um, sort of uh, um, factor, a very positive factor, is it's we can serve more people and we can have more revenues because our systems are more aware of how to serve more people. Thanks. Thanks. Uh